good? OK. All right, so talking about AppStream with Cornell today. Um, really great service that we introduced. I think it's been over a year and a half now. Um, in a nutshell, easiest way to think of, you know, if the question was, what is AppStream? Um, any Windows-based application, you can stream into a browser. So if you have a Mac or a Linux or something on the other end, get an HTML5 compatible browser, and you can pull that app down. Uh, we'll talk about some use cases today. We'll talk about what the Cornell team's doing um, and some stuff that might be specific to you that you'd want to do in your environment. The nice piece with AppStream, right, the servers, the GPUs, compute, all of that is up in the cloud. You don't have to worry about managing it or dealing with it. Um, and end user delivery, it's pretty easy. Open up a browser, ready to go. Um, you get instant access to 3D applications as well. So if you have CAD applications or something that needs a GPU in it, again, without having to go and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on these new high-end GPUs, you can use them in the Amazon cloud, put them in, and it's like most of our other services, it's pay as you go or pay as you need. And it's also secure, <coughs> excuse me, secured through identity and access management. So you can tie it and federate it with your users. So if you have Active Directory, you can just tie those users right into the authentication piece. Um, and it's a consistent performance. So you can hit a baseline and hit that same thing every single time, which is really important for some of the CAD applications that we talk about. You know, rendering, like you need this high level of performance. Um, but you don't have to use it just for CAD applications. There's lots of business applications. Um, and Everybody's probably got one of these, this thing in your data center in your application environment that has a fence around it and you hope it dies at some point and you can't get rid of it. Um, and then you have to go and take a client, an old client, and put it out to all your workstations or your end users. This is actually a really nice use case for it because you can still keep that going and you don't have to do the in-client applications. So you think of any of those old applications that have a really thick, heavy client that you would have to go and install on all the Windows machines. You could actually take this now up in AWS and do that application delivery to your end users. Uh, makes life a lot easier. Another use case around design and engineering. We're going to focus a lot on that today in the session. ISVs. Um, so this is kind of that same idea with the legacy application in your enterprise that you need to go and deliver. Um, we work with ISVs that have legacy applications that they just can't, you know, if sassify is a word would be a way to look at it. And they still have a thick client that they want to go and deliver. This is a great way for them to go through and do that. And then education. Uh, there's a lot of interesting use cases that come in around this one. Um, I, I love when I was talking to the guys at Cornell um, and the team and we're looking at you know, all these great things we could go and how could we use it. And I was like, you know, let's do a really nice easy one like Word or Excel. And I think Marty was the one. He's like, no, I have MATLAB and a license server and a, like four other applications. And he's like, and if we can do that, we can do anything. Um, and I was like, but you don't want to start really nice and easy? <laughs> and you just see these guys totally hit it out of the park. Um, another interesting thing for Cornell when we talked about, you know, for the end user, the students, um, there's classrooms and there's labs and they have to staff these and man these and buy all the workstations. Um, it's costly, right? And you need to have someone in the room a lot of the times. Um, so having to get students go across campus. I mean, it snows up in Ithaca every once in a while. Um, and somebody had this great idea. It's like, wouldn't it be great if the students didn't have to trudge across campus and they could just do this from their dorm rooms or from Starbucks or wherever? Um, so I thought that was a really cool use case, like really looking at the student experience for this. So when you're using AppStream, uh, streaming protocol, it's secured in transit, encrypted in transit. Um, same thing with the, the application, the business logic, the authentication, all of that's encrypted in transit. Um, and it has an ad adaptive quality of service. So as you're going through, um, everybody's, you know, if you're at a coffee shop, your wireless is good. Sometimes it's not. Um, AppStream will move with that. So if you get a higher latency connection, it'll go through and adapt. Um, and it's optimized for image quality. We have a great video we'll show you just really about like 3D rendering and how the application handles it. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to the Cornell team. Chris. Hey everybody, good morning. Uh, I am Chris Barth from Cornell uh, CIT Desktop Engineering. Uh, this is my first time speaking at a conference at Amazon, so I FaceTimed my wife to get a boost of confidence, and she said, why are you wearing all black? And I said, well, that's like what everybody does in these presentations, and she said, you look like a young evil Santa Claus. And I haven't been able to stop thinking about that for like the last five hours, uh, so ho, ho, ho. <laughs> um, AppStream, and let's talk about Cornell here for a minute. 
Uh, Cornell University is an Ivy League university located in Ithaca, New York in the Finger Lakes region. Uh, it's ranked number 14 among the world's universities. Uh, Ezra Cornell gave us our motto, and it is, I would found an institution where any person can find instruction in any study. And I'll update that a little bit and say, any, use any application. And now that I've updated the founder of the institution's motto, I'm probably in trouble. Uh, we have 21,900 students and 1,648 professors, 4,000 courses that we might be able to use AppStream for uh, across 100 academic departments. Um, there's 108 graduate fields of study, and then on the right in that picture uh, is a gorge. If you ever see those t-shirts, Ithaca is gorgeous, that's what they're talking about. Literally through the campus, there are cavernous gorges that you can walk through and see the waterfalls and stuff. I'm here to talk to you today about using AppStream to keep your hair. Uh, you can see it's helping me a lot. <laughs> the, uh, a little bit about my background is I joined Cornell three years ago. I didn't really know what my job was gonna be, which sounds weird, but it was true. Uh, I landed at CIT, which is Central IT Services for all the campus. Um, we, prov we work with 18 different IT service groups, so each academic college, like the law school, has their own IT team. Um, primarily, I've worked with SCCM and JAMF and VDI. Uh, and it's always been about delivering applications and configurations and keeping things secure. Cornell, for me, is a dream job. I've been a corporate IT person, but I really wanted to make a big difference. And when you become a staff member, you get to meet with the CIO. And I told Dave Lipka, I, if I can even make Word install like five minutes faster, somehow that's helping a professor that's inventing a world's first thing. And like somewhere out there in outer space, I like had five minutes worth of work to help that. And AppStream is a whole different ball game than just getting Word to install faster. Um, I've been able to be in the classroom and see the way that this can change the way that professors teach and students learn. We've been piloting AppStream since 2017. Uh, we've got through the proof of concept. Uh, seven classes have used it, over 500 students. And we're going to continue to build the service around AppStream to try to deliver AppStream and applications to all the classes on campus. Uh, this is our team. There is me and uh, Lori Beebe. We're like the front-facing people, go gather the business requirements, um, figure out what applications people want, get the configurations and the installations, as well as go and uh, do all the QA. So we go in the image and set it all up and make sure it all works the way that it's expected. Uh, we have Marty and Dan, who you'll hear from, from the cloudification team. Uh, they do all like the Amazon stuff, uh, and I'll just let them tell you about that part. We also have two web developers that are making a website portal that students can log in and see. I'm a Cornell student with a net ID, and these are all the classes that I have AppStream available for, as well as a way for on campus the TSPs, the technical service providers, to upload their own packages and essentially build their own AppStream, and the professors to schedule uh, when they want things on and off to leverage the scaling to save as much as possible. Furthering the academic mission, when I got a chance to talk to the highest people in the university at the president level, I said, what would you like Cornell IT to be the best at? Cloud, security, what should we do? And they said, we want you to make this the best place for students and faculty, whatever you can do, invest in the academic mission. Uh, furthering the academic mission, lowering economic barriers. Uh, that was an interesting one that someone pointed out that the colleges have to make recommendations of what kind of laptop or computer you should buy depending on what your study is and trying to predict something that's gonna last you four six or eight years, that's like really hard to do and it's expensive. With AppStream, you can buy a mid-level or entry-level kind of like Chromebook device and just use all your computing power in the cloud for the whole time. So, you know, parents are happy because now it's a $300 or $500 purchase instead of a $1,000 purchase. Uh, eliminates hardware barriers. We have a lot of hardware labs on campus, but, you know, it's a four-year hardware refresh cycle and uh, a new version of something will come out and it'll immediately need a new graphics card or a RAM upgrade. So using AppStream, you can just get e GPUs and RAM and CPUs whenever you want to. Lowering and removing operating system software barriers. Uh, a lot of the apps that the students are able to get are free through student licensing, but they're Windows apps and all of them have MacBooks. So it's really hard, you know, you could set up parallels and do things like that, but let's get rid of that work. Like, let's not make them have to configure, install, and do different things. Let's just use AppStream through a web browser and give them their apps. Bring the lab to the classroom. So, where before we'd be in a room, and maybe we had a dozen computers, all of you using your computers, I could put up a URL. You're already enrolled in the class and have an AppStream session available. 
where before it'd be something where you would just listen to me or watch me move it, now you can do it too. Uh, students and professors don't need to install or configure software. Uh, one of the things that is happening, I guess, is we are at the mobile generation. Like the students are tablet, iPad, you know, Android users. They're not really computer users the way that I was when I was a little kid, or I guess a college student. Um, so they say, the professors, that configuring the technology could be a barrier for someone entering the class. So if you're doing really cool statistical work, just trying to get things to work on your computer is a barrier where students will actually end up dropping out of classes. So if we can remove that software barrier, then they'll just be able to do their work. Um, AppStream sessions are pre-configured. They're tested so that everyone has the same access to the same version for the courses. And it makes group projects more flexible. You don't have to go to the same place. You can all be online. You can be in a web session sharing videos, doing things together. Uh, this is Professor Rajesh Baskaran. He is from the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Program. Uh, he is the first professor on campus to try to make this work, and we've been working with him closely. And now you're going to be able to hear from him directly about his use in uh, Amazon AppStream on campus. Prepare our students, Askren. I have a fun job teaching engineering simulations at Cornell University. I help prepare our students to use simulation apps that are very important in engineering analysis and design. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how Amazon AppStream 2.0 allows our students to use any computer to run graphics-intensive simulation applications like ANSYS Fluent in a web browser. And the particular simulation I'm going to show you is Airflow over a wind turbine rotor. My vision is the democratization of simulation, and AppStream enables that by putting simulation apps at students' fingertips. At Cornell, we have been piloting AppStream in select courses to enable students to access course software from any device at any time. For one of the courses, previously we have distributed course software on CDs through the Cornell Bookstore. Now, with AppStream, students are able to access the same software in a web browser, irrespective of the kind of personal device they have. As you can imagine, this is logistically much simpler. It has also enabled us to bring uh, hands-on software instruction into discussion sections uh, because students are able to access the software from, from any device. Most engineering design and simulation applications are PC-based, while many of our students have Macs. Um, and AppStream now enables students with Macs also to run these PC-based applications. Students don't, don't have to worry about getting a particular kind of laptop or messing with application configuration or finding a free computer lab. They just open up a web browser and get the same consistent experience as if the software was installed locally. AppStream makes things simpler for me. It's usually a problem finding a suitable computer lab during popular course times, and I have to tear my hair out to, in, in doing that, and you can see the effect of that. That worry goes away with AppStream. Um, it also makes life easier for our IT department. Uh, AppStream is fully managed. It's secured within a web browser and has access to our existing network, so the IT folks don't have to worry about application distribution, you know, which version is installed in which computer lab, or about securing these applications. These are just some of the ways in which AppStream enables exciting new ways of teaching and learning while also making the technology environment simpler. Let me move on to give you a demonstration of the wind turbine blade simulation taken from our wind energy course. Here is a model wind turbine rotor that is designed and 3D printed by students in a wind energy course. This 3D printed model didn't come out quite right, so it's become my prop. Students test these models in the wind tunnel to predict what kind of power they can extract from the wind with this, this kind of design. Um, and another group of students does a simulation to also predict what kind of power they can get from this design. Let me show you the simulation running in the app stream. So this is, AppStream is running in a tab of the Chrome browser, and when students come in, they can pick between different applications. The particular application I've picked is 
ANSYS, which is an industry stand for these kinds of simulations. This shows you the, the, the blade um, in, in ANSYS. So this is the same geometry that students test in the wind tunnel. And using some mathematical tricks, you just you simulate flow over a single blade rather than three. And, um, and if I zoom out, I can see the, um, there's a region around the blade, and you're simulating the flow between the blade and this outer region. And you have to divide this region into little chunks uh, for the solver to approximate the equations on those little chunks. That's called meshing. And this is an outer view of the mesh. And let's take a look at what, you know, what the mesh looks like as I cut through it. So if I cut through the mesh and I zoom in, Okay, I can see, you know, I have, um, I have much finer resolution near the blade. That's where most of the action is happening. So you need finer resolution. So you need to interrogate what's happening with the mesh near the blade. And then you can actually move the cut plane or the section plane. Um, and this is really important to interrogate what's happening with the mesh near the blade. And I, I can't tell when I do this. Um, that I'm running on a remote machine, and, and that's really uh, very impressive. And then you get the solver to solve the equations, and then you can look at the results, which is uh, the most exciting part. So this is single blade reflected twice to show you three blades, and we ignore the hub. Um, these are pretty challenging simulations, and so we try to make as many approximations as we, ca as we can, you know, as, uh, at least when we start off, and then we can bring in the hub at the next level of approximation. I can look at the pressure over the blade. Um, so let me take a look at that. Red is higher pressure. Um, so where the wind is coming and hitting the blade, you have higher pressure. And behind, uh, you have lower pressure, which is indicated by these blues and greens. Um, but really, one has to interrogate whether these values of pressure make sense. And that's the kind of engineering judgment we, we try to teach. And you can also look at what the flow is doing over the blade. Uh, let me show you that. Um, so I'll go to a single blade and then enable what are called uh, streamlines to see what the flow is doing over the blade. And the idea is that, uh, let me manipulate the view here, um, is that when you uh, release a fluid particle over here, it's going to follow this trajectory. And you see that there is, you know, a dead water region over here that leads to losses, and this blade needs to be redesigned to minimize that. So that's a quick demo of a cool simulation run in a web browser using uh, Amazon AppStream. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, and thank you to Matt Yulinski and all of our students and everybody that's helped us you know, get this project moving forward. Um, so I'm saying let's use AppStream to help our users keep their hair, uh, reduce the anxiety around campus, just give them what they want when they need it, uh, and you know, reduce support all around campus and make it a better experience. Uh, thank you very much, and now you'll hear from Dan. Thanks for that, Chris. Is this on? Yes, it is. Uh, as you can see, Chris clearly figured out the answer much sooner than I have. <clears throat> so my name is Dan Klinger. I work on the cloud team at Cornell University. I've got just over 12 years experience in IT, uh, roles ranging from desktop support to computer lab and system administration. Uh, to my current role now, all of which have had a primary focus on automation and working smarter and not harder. My very first role as a desktop support specialist, I realized very quickly the inefficiencies involved with that job. Uh, a customer would have a problem, they would send us a support ticket, they would give us a call, shoot us an email. IT staff would stroll across campus, as fun as that is, it was a lot of time wasted. Um, so I, I started asking myself, there must be a better way that we can do this, right? We were displacing these customers from their workstations, sitting down, trial and error, troubleshooting, 
on, on their clock, right, while they're supposed to be teaching and educating. So I started asking, the, you know, I started saying to myself, there must be a better way. Certainly there was. Technology didn't fail us then. We started looking into remote support tools, which helped simplify the process. We were able to assist more customers in a much more timely fashion rather than walking across campus. That was very beneficial. Another responsibility of mine in that same role was computer lab management. Uh, as Chris had mentioned, um, computer lab refreshes as the dreaded time of year when probably hardware, operating systems, and or applications have to be upgraded on every system in the lab. So we're shutting down the lab, the entire IT, sta IT staff is spent upgrading all of these computer labs across campus. Again, there must be a better way. <clears throat> Another responsibility of mine in that same role was application upgrades and installs. While remote support tools helped with that process, the dreaded once or twice a year when Firefox or Flash needed an upgrade, even the remote support tools didn't help solve that problem. Luckily for me, when I started at Cornell, there was a better way. They had tools in place. Chris mentioned SCCM and JAM. I quickly gravitated toward those tools, learned as much as I could, became our CM administrator, our JAMP administrator, saw the value in scripting languages like PowerShell and Bash, realized the power that those had. We were able to customize installations, uninstall software, the multiple different versions that were on everyone's computers. We could script that and do that at the click of a button. We could install that on all, all staff's systems across campus. There was a lot of value in that. This is what I'd been hoping for. This is what I'd been waiting for. It was pretty cool. So I got pretty good at that, and then I heard of a new technology, right? Application virtualization. More specifically, streaming application virtualization. The concept of having some systems sitting in our server farm and thus being able to stream applications out to our customers was huge, right? That took out that whole custom scripting aspect that whole system inconsistency aspect. It didn't matter if you were on a Mac, if you were on Windows 7, Windows 8, or Windows 10. We didn't have to uninstall the 15 different versions of Chrome on your system. We were able to simply install it in one location, provide it out to people. Huge value. There were some downsides, right? There's a custom application that everyone had to install to be able to utilize the service. We were clicking next on each of our session hosts to install the applications, right? A lot of room for human error. So not perfect, certainly some gains to be made. Um, at that time, right around that time, some people started talking on campus about forming a committee to come up with a better way for application delivery. So we all got together, I was invited, and we started discussing how can we do this better? How can we deliver applications in an efficient manner to staff, faculty, and students? So that was a new concept. Right? In my head, I'm thinking oh, our, our couple of session hosts up in, up in our server farm, we're gonna need to bump that up. That's gonna be a lot more work, that's gonna be a lot more maintenance, uh, IT security is going to have to be involved. Our infrastructure guys are going to be upset. There's a lot involved. So we started doing our research. We settled on AppStream, right? Because then we can use the cloud computing. We don't have to worry about managing systems in our server farm. We let AWS do all that for us. That then opened the door for customer easeability, right? We can provide the customer a URL. They can click on a link and launch their application at any time, at their leisure. It also opened the door for bring your own device. No custom app required anymore, simply HTML5 web browser. It also helps with system inconsistencies. 
right? We don't have to worry about all of these different inconsistencies across campus. We also have as many resources as we want, right? AppStream solved that problem that we are concerned with on, for our on-premise solution. Time wasn't spent managing systems in the server farm, which is great for us. I don't want to do that. <clears throat> okay, great, that's all. We, we know we landed there. We, we're up here talking about AppStream. Now, let's get into the automation. How do we do it? So for us, we have all of these applications that we've been deploying for a long time. Right? We have the silent install switches. We have all of the custom scripts. We have all the installation files. IT staff has all of that. So we've converted most of that stuff into YAML config files. We upload those YAML config files and any other custom scripts to GitHub. We're then also utilizing S3 for all of our installation files. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you can see here, this is simply done by one IT staff member, or a couple, or a team. Once they're up there, then we can automate this entire process. Our image builders, which is basically our starting home base, the system that's being sysprepped and then deployed to a fleet and available to all of our users, that image builder, we, we bind all of ours to the domain. So that opens the door for group policy and more automation. Using group policy, we're, we're using bootstrap scripts to completely automate that entire process. We're installing Git, we're installing system internals, we're installing PowerShell 5.0 and any custom modules, Python and any other de dependencies, and also the Chocolatey app. Marty's gonna dig a little bit deeper into this model, so wait for his. <clears throat> Okay, so I mentioned Chocolatey. It's an open source package management tool. We're utilizing it for applications that are being installed on a majority of our images. So we can simply reference their trusted repo, grab their files, we don't have to reinvent the wheel and reinstall any apps. Apps like Chrome and 7-Zip, things that are being installed across all of our systems. We also have, as part of that bootstrap script, we've got some Python and PowerShell scripts that are going through those custom YAML files and parsing them out and running certain Windows tasks. So we're installing those chocolatey apps, we're installing the applications, we've already got that information in the YAML files. Here's a brief look, if you can see it, of what our YAML file looks like it's got, as you can see, all of these silent install switches. It's got the applications that are being installed, where the executable lives, so that the image assistant knows where to launch it from. With this, we can also do any kind of Windows custom tasks. So if we need to copy a file, we can specify exactly where we're gonna copy the file. If there's a special service that needs to be stopped or started, we can do that right in the YAML file. Our PowerShell scripts are, are parsing that out and performing those tasks. We can run scheduled tasks. We can create our own scheduled tasks. We can also do anything that we need to with the registry. So there certainly is some preliminary work. But once that's done for that application, it's a click of a button going forward for anyone that wants to use this across campus. Thank you, and now I'll pass it over to Marty, the mastermind behind this entire operation. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Marty Sullivan. Uh, I have several roles at the Cornell University. Um, my main role is uh, DevOps and cloud engineer with the cloud team, so I work with Dan and that team. Um, so we work with a lot of different campus units on, on different things. 
Um, I also work for the Department of Atmospheric Science at Cornell doing some pretty cool digital agriculture projects, so keep your eye out for those in the future. I'll be presenting on those uh, starting in July. Um, and uh, I'm also a, a master's student in information science, so I think that I have a unique perspective of like a student who's taken some of these courses, who like uses this, you know, I've used like uh, um, Autodesk, Inventor, and Fusion, and, and a lot of the applications that these students are actually using. And I've seen the difficulties of like, you know, how do we actually, you know, install this? Because I use a Mac. I mean, I've got my Mac up here right now, and, and you know, I, as an IT person, can install, you know, VMware or something on there and, and get it to work. But it, it was such a challenge, like, working in a group of people and having them have to, like, configure software on their machine. So, um, in one of my past positions, I also uh, managed a computer lab, too. So, I, you know, when this project sort of showed its face in my uh, <coughs> uh, team, I was, like, really sort of interested in, like, you know, how can I take DevOps, like our DevOps paradigm, and, and assign it to, you know, traditional desktop computing. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so there's two, like, main building blocks, DevOps-wise, that um, through observing, you know, how our labs team worked at Cornell to set up, like, the software in, com in physical computer labs. And, uh, you know, so I worked with them a lot to figure out, well, how can we actually you know, move this to AppStream and take some of what they already have but improve upon it. So um, the first thing I, like, you know, as a DevOps person, like source control is like the most important thing, right? So I got them using GitHub and we hit, our team does like a GitHub training um, and any like, you know, those scripts that they write that are custom and, you know, 20 different groups on campus have their own, you know, it, it makes it so easy to um, actually like collaborate on these things. And this is like really where the time and skill is required, like trying to train somebody in like how to use like this packaging framework, like that can be really intimidating to like some support staff who just like, you know, haven't used tools like that before. And you know, well I've already done all this work making these scripts. So like one of the things that I really like tried to do in this process was like let's n try not to like have to like re redo everything. Let's try to like integrate what you've already done into this existing system. So um, that's like the first like important thing is like sort of getting all of your IT staff involved in a, in a you know consistent way. Um, so the second building block is automation. Um, so uh, I'm really focused on cloud and using Amazon uh, for most of everything I do at Cornell. Um, so to me, the most important component is infrastructure is code. So we use CloudFormation to really deploy most of our, um, all of our deployments, like start as a, as a template. Um, we actually abstract the uh, templates away though. Like, so we actually write scripts that generate CloudFormation templates. Um, so we use Python and the Troposphere open source module to uh, do that. Um, and that's like one of my favorite tools that I use every day. So, um, and so like to me, like the most important thing here was like, well, we need to do, how do we make it so like IT support staff can do something once and then get like this consistent result every time. So it's like, like I said, we started with GitHub. So like, we got some code up in GitHub. So my job was then to say, like, let's like make a real like CI C D pipeline to, you know, take these scripts, put them where they need to go, and run them and, and get our, you know, app stream image, you know, for this course or something like that. Um, and of course all of this enables like super fast production approval. So it's no longer like a quarterly lab image or something. It's like if, if a professor needs something updated or a new version of something or something just like wasn't set up correctly, it's like we can edit the code in GitHub and within a day or two like have those, you know, results in place. Um, 
So this diagram is, is sort of an expanded view of sort of all of the tools we're using. So in the top left there is sort of what Dan went over. So um, getting scripts and stuff up to GitHub and uh, making those configuration files um, in a standard way across all of our applications that we want to deliver. Um, so that's sort of like that top left and you can see like it sort of results in a custom image. But there's a lot that happens between GitHub and getting to that custom image. So um, we really want to enable self-service for uh, faculty and TAs and anybody else like administrative staff, teaching support who uh, need to set things up for classes. So our vision is to actually create like a web a website where you know a faculty member can go and say uh, you know they'll see a screen of like apps and be able to choose the ones they need for their course and you know th go from there and when they you know fill out that form it you know we're using uh, Amazon Step Functions which is another one of my favorite services super simple way to you know do a sequence of tasks. Um, and that's sort of driving this whole automation process. So um, that will start at a base image that Amazon provides, uh, do all of the automation that Dan talked about inside the image, inside the image builder itself, um, and then that results in our, in our custom image for that course, say, for example. Um, and from that point, the automation then like deploys that new image to a fleet, which is like the app stream term for like the auto scaling um, for the service. Um, and then you can see on the right that the students actually, you know, from that point are able to just use their web browser. They log in with our, you know, Cornell federated identity. Um, and then that goes through Amazon's IAM service and then they're able to instantly access their applications and they don't have to do anything special. Um, so I'm gonna give a quick um, demo of sort of what our web design team has put together um, in terms of, you know, what is this gonna look like to people who use it. So the first page I'm gonna go over here is our deployment administration page. So this is something like the tech support provider would use. So this is like, you know, um, we want, these are like, you know, all of the apps that um, exist already. Um, and, you know, this could also be something that faculty or TA uses um, and says, I want like these three applications, MS Office, MATLAB, and SOLIDWORKS. Um, and then they choose like the deployment type they wanna use. So in our case, like we're usually delivering graphics intensive applications. So we've been using their uh, graphics instance types. Um, there's like a, a zip file with the uh, private in installation files and things like that that gets uploaded. Um, and then there's also an opportunity for the administrator to you know do some manual steps if they're if if needed during that process um, so that's I think you know a cool vision to like enable IT administrators to like hey you know create new packages uh, in a web interface in a standard way um, so this is sort of like what the um, step functions, the state machine looks like. So this is, so you can see like there's a bunch of steps that you know you might uh, expect as an, as an Amazon administrator. So you know, we're creating um, a federated session for the image builder to use to have access to um, all of the resource it ne resources it needs to access, like including step functions itself. Because it, we actually created a, like, a custom activity for step functions that runs inside of the image builder. Um, and it goes through and, and uh, you know, uh, this process in the center here goes through, um, that's all happening inside the image builder. And it's, you know, installing all of the applications after a short bootstrap process that sort of uh, initializes everything. Um, and then the last section here um, is, you know, a snapshot is initiated, 
Um, and then you know, the, you're gonna go through and it's gonna actually create a fleet and a stack to test with. And then there's also an approval step after this where an admin can say, all right, like everything's working, the image checks out, and then it can be immediately deployed to production. So, um, so now like let's talk more about like uh, the faculty and TA perspective. So um, one of the challenges we've found in delivering stuff like this to a course is um, predicting how students use the service, right? Because I mean, the only thing that's easy to predict is if a professor wants to like in class, like have a lab period, like we can, you know, provision uh, X number of uh, instances for that many students, and that makes sense, right? Um, but really that's not the use case that is prominent at Cornell. Usually like, a uh, professor like assigns a, an assignment and then students have like a week or two weeks to work on it. So it's really not easy to predict that behavior and, and like, cause some students are gonna use it in the middle of the night, others are gonna use it, you know, at lunchtime or whatever. So we identified these sort of like four patterns that we saw students using um, AppStream. So we're calling them like lab hours, assignment hours, free hours and restricted hours. So uh, the two important ones I think are lab hours and assignment hours. So for lab hours, that's like, you know, the scenario I already described where, you know, there's 20 students in a class or 50 students in a class and they all need um, to be able to access AppStream at the same time. Um, so assignment hours is where we need to sort of get more intelligent and kind of, uh, you know, come up with a real scaling policy that, that um, you know, meets our students' needs. Um, and basically you can see like, you know, the faculty will have the ability to sort of give a time range, give us the number of users, a name for this um, deployment, and then like, you know, sort of similar to like making any sort of event on a calendar. You know, they have these options to like create a daily schedule or weekly, uh, you know, and it's something you'd expect when you're scheduling something. Um, and this allows us, like with these parameters, we can then create an intelligent way for, you know, an intelligent scaling policy for when, you know, those students, we can expect a certain number of students to be using it. Um, and also something we didn't really expect, although in retrospect it seems like pretty important, is the faculty, their idea from the beginning was like, well, we really like the idea of AppStream because it'll give us insight into how our students are doing their work in class and how long it's taking them to do their assignments. So we're planning on giving them direct access to the metrics of like, you know, that number of students, you know, looking at individual students even and, and, you know, how long, you know, they can see like maybe one student or two students are taking like longer than everyone else and they can, sort of reach out to them and say like, you know, figure out what, you know, their um, learning issue is or how they can teach those specific students better. And again, it's all about, you know, making students successful. So um, if they can figure out that a student's having issues and address that directly, um, that can be the difference between that student passing or failing the class, so. Um, and then this is just like basically what the landing page for a student would look like. So these are like the, the courses we delivered to last semester. Um, and we have like a little demo that we use when we sort of introduce this to new people around campus. Um, and we're gonna be, you know, we're working on different methods of, you know, how we're gonna authenticate students to what, you know, they should have access to, but that's all gonna happen on this page. So, um, that's everything that we've sort of put together so far. Um, and uh, it looks like we have a couple minutes, like it looks like you maybe have a question or there's a mic behind you there. Yeah, there's a microphone back there if you could go uh, so everyone can hear. Yeah, I, I have a few questions. Number one is the student authentication scheme that you have, is it local? You have web server 
locally uh, installed or is it also in the Amazon cloud? Great question. Um, so we're actually building a serverless web interface for this. So we're using API Gateway and Lambda functions for the back end, and then we're delivering the static assets that you were just looking at through CloudFront and an S3 bucket. So great question. Okay, the other question I have is, uh, so if you have 15, 20 students, are you giving a separate desktop or it is a shared workspace when they do some lab simulation work? And um, so how, what kind of expense per student do you incur? So at our university, students, if they need access to like a personal workstation, um, they can actually take out uh, a laptop from our libraries. Um, if they, right now, we're still providing them with computer labs too, so it's sort of like a, a mix and see, and see like how students uh, react to this type of application delivery model. Um, so there's a lot of, we do like offer resources to students who like can't afford a, a system or something, but most students are bringing their own device. That's our, um, that's our experience so far. So no, I mean, uh, the, I'm still not clear for one thing. The simulation workspace that you have in Amazon Cloud, mm -hmm. is that a shared workspace for students? Oh, so, so a student can just log in once at a time because. So yeah, when, when one student logs in, they get their own personal workspace, so that, that once they log into the AppStream service with their Cornell ID, they have their own personal workspace and no one else can get to that. So it's, it's designed more for individual users. Um, there, there isn't like a shared workspace model in the service yet anyway, so. Um, it's easy to make like shared file spaces. Any other questions? Well, we'll be uh, sticking around for a few minutes up front, and then we have to clear the room for the next session coming in. But thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Cornell team. This was awesome. Yeah. We'll be here.